Yeah, this one's for Haifa, Yafa, Akka, Gaza, Ariha, Ramallah, Tabariya, Ramla, Janine, Safa, Midlaham, El Quds, Mina Sahra, the Lishban, and every Philistine you heard around the world where boys and girls are taught to hit bitch for they walk, learn to zahret for they talk. With the threes ain't just an arts part and parcel of a lifestyle that connects them to the roots of olive trees and orange groves with thuggish settlers pointing. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, for the introduction and for all the contributing artists from everybody for showing up here today. So my name is Malik Abdul Samad and this is Anwar Jibran, and we're the founders of Community in Arabic. Um, so we're, we're very honored to have you here at, the, at this event, which is a collaboration with Muntada Fawaz Qanut Al Musiqa Al Arabiya. And we're very proud to be partnering with you, Amni, and just to keep uh, Muntada going. But before we start, we wanted to take a minute to talk about the history of the Arab American community um, in the United States. You know, the Arab American community is a very rich and diverse community that has a history here for well over a century. It was actually in the summer of 1854 that a man by the name of Anthony Mishalani um, boarded a ship from the coast of the modern day Lebanon to immigrate to the United States. Um, he arrived in Ellis Island in New York three months later, and Anthony is the first Arab on record to have immigrated to the United States. In the 170 years since he came here, the Arab community grew from a handful of people to uh, millions living and working all across North America, making great contributions to the American society and blending within the fabric of the American society. And really making contributions across multiple fields from business to sciences, um, to medicine, to the arts, and, and, and many more. People are really worth recognizing. You know, we have from the brilliance of Gibran Khalil Gibran, um, who established al Rabit al-Qalami in New York in the early 19th century, um, to Najib Halabi, who pioneered aviation and is known for making the first transcontinental jet flight in American history, um, to Ralph Nader, who Atlantic called one of the most, the three most influential Americans living today. It's a really big deal. Um, to many more artists and, and, and actors and actresses, um, and you know, people like DJ Khaled, The Red One, Tony Shalhou, Brami Malik, Paula Abdul, and many more, to finally the vital contributions of scientists like uh, Munsef Slawi, who led the efforts to create the vaccine during the, the, the pandemic. So Arab Americans have really contributed, integrated, and interacted with the, with the American society and became a rich component of the American melting pot here. And you know, despite the challenges and the uh, discrimination Arab Americans faced uh, after the World War One and World War Two, and the backlash of uh, the aftermath of 9/11, uh, uh, Arab Americans continued uh, to to persevere and uh, continued their their vital contribution to the American society. And you know, uh, and it is our duty as Arab Americans to work together and promote a better understanding of our culture and history. And uh, you know to maintain, in the meantime, to maintain our uh, cultural identity. Our mission, as Malik mentioned, uh, as community in Arabic platform, is to highlight inspiring stories of Arab Americans who are currently making great contribution to our society, and uh, you know, inspiring next generation Arab immigrants uh, to uh, and lead the way. And there's no better example, actually, uh, than our guest uh, for today, uh, Omar Afendim. Uh, Omar Afendim is a rapper and, uh, uh, and poet uh, based in uh, New York. Uh, Omar was recognized by, by global uh, media outlets. Uh, Omar uh, um, lectured in prestigious uh, academic institutions and, of course, uh, raised millions of dollars for humanitarian causes. Uh, Omar was named as uh, the Kennedy uh, Center Citizen uh, Fellow in, in, in 2019. I want to welcome Omar to, to the stage. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, everyone. We have a round of applause for Chicago and Arabic. And for that. It's great to be here. 
Thank you so much. We're really excited to kick off this chat. So, you know, Amar, let's start by talking a little bit about, you know, your background and your immigration journey to the U.S. Sure. Um, so for folks who aren't familiar, my family history uh, is certainly rooted in Syria. First and foremost, my father was from Hama, uh, which is a central western Syrian city, maybe the fourth largest city, uh, ancient city on the banks of the Orontes River in Nahr al-Asli. Uh, and my mother is from Damascus, um, which is the capital. It's the longest continuously inhabited city on earth. Although if you ask people from uh, Ariha, they'll say that's the longest continuously inhabited city. <laughs> and if you ask people from Erbil, they'll say that's the longest continuously inhabited city. But anyway, it's an old city. Uh, and um, I was actually born in Saudi Arabia. I was uh, about four years old when we left Saudi and immigrated to the United States. Our first pit stop was Queens at my aunt uh, Hazar's house, Allah Hama, for a brief uh, period. And then we settled ultimately in uh, Washington, DC, the capital. Uh, and I grew up there. I happened to actually uh, have the good fortune of when we first moved, same year, 1985, uh, had a uh, Arabic school founded in the DC area, uh, founded by the ambassador of uh, Saudi Arabia, Prince Bandar bin Sultan. Basically a school that was designed for children of embassy staff to be able to have, uh, to give their children access to the Arabic language and to Arabic curriculum on par with what was taught in the Arab world so that they could transition back in a couple years when their, when their term was up, you know, relatively easily. But they had opened it to anybody who wanted their children to learn Arabic in the community and it was fully funded by the Saudi government at the time. Oil money was flowing and things were good back in the 80s. So, uh, so it was actually a very diverse uh, student body. Uh, it had children not just from the Arabic speaking world attending, but like the entire quote unquote Muslim world. In fact, we had non-Muslims attending a Muslim school because it was, had such a good reputation, if you could believe it, early on. Um, it's like unheard of now to think about that happening nowadays, but that's what it was like back then. It was different. Uh, so yeah, it was an immersive environment. We studied Arabic every day a couple hours in addition to uh, the local Fairfax County curriculum. It was based in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where I, I first started making Arab friends and really digging deeper into not just the Syrian, but a sort of Arab, pan-Arab identity. Great. And when did you immigrate to the US and how did that come about? Yeah, 1985, uh, the year that we moved here. Uh, uh, it was basically, you know, I mentioned I was born in Saudi Arabia and um, my eldest sister, Rama, who was a guest on your, mm -hmm your program some time ago, it was actually born in Syria. So my parents were, born, were married in Syria, in Damascus. They had uh, my eldest sister, Rama, there. And then my father ended up landing a job in Saudi. And so we ended up moving there prior to me being born, obviously. Um, so my other sister, Nawara, was born there in al Khobar, And then my brother, Muhammad, and then I uh, was born there. And by the time I was four, we ended up moving here. The uh, interesting thing is that when I was in Saudi and I was still, you know, between the ages of, you know, what, what, when you start learning a language, I guess around like one or so, they were so concerned with me only knowing Arabic that they taught me English there. And lo and behold, we ended up moving uh, and the, th the opposite happened, you know. They were so concerned about me losing Arabic that they enrolled <laughs> me in the Arabic school. So. And when did your passion to music start? My passion for music, uh, I think it was always there. I've always loved music. I, I had an interesting duality growing up where, you know, on the bus rides to school, uh, I would be listening to hip hop music. I loved hip hop music and rap music. Uh, I grew up in the DC area, like I said, it was affectionately dubbed Chocolate City because it had a huge black population, uh, very influential. So I grew up listening to radio stations like WPGC, WKYS, BET was founded in DC, and there was just this like really, um, this beautiful culture around me, African American culture that uh, was very inspiring for me, being somebody from the margins, somebody from uh, just a, a different place. And I found interesting like connections sonically and lyrically uh, 
uh, to my Arabness and to Islam uh, through hip hop. Uh, hearing rappers talk about Allah, talk about the Prophet Muhammad, talk about break fast like Ramadan, like all kinds of things that just made me feel a, a, a connection to this culture that clearly wasn't mine, but I, f I felt was more uh, relatable to me, perhaps, than white culture, for lack of a better word. So I, I was drawn to it. I was drawn to hip hop. And there was also a, a, just like this deep reverence for lyricism, for storytelling and rap music that I, uh, I felt like I saw a parallel between uh, with what I was studying in school. So I'd go from listening to this music on the bus to going into Arabic class. And for anybody who studies Arabic, you quickly learn that you know, poetry is the backbone of our language. And so poetry was like a weekly thing we'd be studying shara from all, you know, 1,500 years ago, from Al-Mutanabbi, Amr Al-Qais, all kinds of people, to uh, Nizar Abani, Mahmoud Darwish, etc. And, uh, and I'd start to see interesting thematic connections between what I was hearing in the music that I loved and what I was reading. Just in terms of the way a poet would represent themselves, in terms of the things that they felt were important to talk about, um, representing your community, representing your tribe, representing your people, your history, uh, even battle poetry, like poets, you know, Sha'ad al hijat it's like a big thing that we have in Arab culture where you're quite literally battling another poet, flexing lyrically, and you see that in hip-hop quite clearly also. So that and uh, eulogy, the poetry of eulogy and praising someone who might have, you know, passed away, someone great in your family or, you know, a bigger figure even in our, in our culture. Uh, all those things, I saw parallels between that and rap music, and so it just became something that I wanted to explore more. Um, but I didn't actually make music myself until I got into college. I graduated from uh, the Saudi Academy, Islamic Saudi Academy, in 1999, and I moved uh, to Charlottesville, Virginia, and I studied architecture at the University of Virginia. And so when you're studying architecture, you're told that, you know, uh, the ancient Greeks said architecture is frozen music and, uh, and there are interesting parallels just between music and art and architecture and so that was around the same time that I started to experiment with making beats. I was like sampling old Arabic music that I heard my mom listening to and, uh, and making beats out of it for my friends to rap to and that's what I first started doing. Uh, and then I had a couple other friends just encouraging me to maybe jump in the cypher and start rapping with them. And I caught the bug uh, early on, I think. Um, but what was interesting is that like, this is all pre-9-11, which uh, for the younger people in the audience, uh, I know that's, that's like a really long time ago. It sounded like maybe how Vietnam sounded to me growing up. You know? <laughs> but it was, it was different then. And I was just like an ambiguously ethnic kid named Omar on campus. You know? Not that I ever hid my Arabness, but it just didn't, it wasn't front and center. Uh, but 9-11 happened halfway through, and uh, that changed how I was perceived, especially when I got on stage, especially when I started rapping, and especially when I started to push back on some of the stereotypes in the media that I was seeing become more prevalent about uh, people from, from our part of the world. And so. Yeah. yeah, and, and uh, you know, to your point, uh, listening to your music, there's a sense of nostalgia in your music. Mm. You know, nostalgia from the from the '80s and '90s uh, of people growing up in the Middle East. Mm. What inspires your music? Uh, I mean, all kinds of things inspire me. Everything from the poetry that I grew up uh, learning and memorizing and reciting to just my 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 children making me laugh in the morning, you know, uh, you can get inspiration from anything. Uh, but the idea of nostalgia, I think it runs really deep in our culture. Uh, we have this, this, you know, profound tradition of al-atlal, you know, the, the standing upon the ruins of your encampment or your, you know, former home and reciting poetry and thinking about it in this really nostalgic way uh, dates you know, predates Islam, like it's just such an important part of being Arab. And uh, I think in some ways there's like an interesting, uh, there's an interesting way that sort of got crossed over into our lives here in the West, uh, quote unquote, and how we think about, you know, the life that we could have had 
if we stayed, you know. Things are different now, I find, because of the social media and the internet. And you're able to kind of keep up with culture back home. They know what we're doing here. We know what they're doing there. But, uh, you know, even in the 80s and 90s, it was like it took work. You know, you had to go back and you had to get like cassettes and CDs and DVDs and bring them back here and share them with your friends and talk about the things that you heard and the shows that you saw on satellite TV or, you know, even pre-satellite with the two or three channels that we had. And, uh, yeah, so there's a nostalgia that's baked into being an immigrant. There's a nostalgia that's baked into being Arab. And I think there's a, a nostalgia that I, myself, I, just being a lover of history, uh, kind of draw upon in my work. And it makes me feel rooted. It gives me a, a sense of purpose. And it gives me something to also, ironically, like look forward to. Um, Meaning like, uh, like poets like Nizar Abani were well into their 60s still packing audio, you know, houses like this and doing what they're doing. So as much as I appreciate what I do as sort of youth culture, I've always wanted to kind of understand it as a lifelong trajectory of exploration and art and uh, to not feel that uh, it was relegated to something that I just did as a kid. You know? So Amar, you know, one of my favorite songs of yours is Close My Eyes, which is a mm. tribute to your late father. Um, you know, the song is very open and, and, and vulnerable. You talk about remembrance, you talk about grief, you talk about Surya and like much more in it. Can you please walk us through, you know, the thought behind the, the music, the, the poetry, the, the open conversation that happens in it and just everything in between creating that song? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for asking that question and I'm glad that you like the song. It's definitely the most personal uh, piece of music and poetry that I've ever created. There's also a video that accompanies it. That, I hasten to call a music video because it's more than that to me. But, um, you know, I lost my father when I was 12 years old, Allah Erhamu. It was just me and him and, uh, you know, a very profound moment, as you can imagine, for a young, young person. I think about that second every day. Uh, and I also think about Fawaz and I think about many young people who have to grow up, you know, without, without a father in this world. Uh, it, it took decades to really make that song, you know. Uh, it was the life experience I'd lived with just having this lump in your throat for years, you know, and not being able to always, like, express it and wanting to kind of just put it out there in a way that I felt was uh, sincere and also, while very personal, hopefully something that other people could benefit from, too. Um, and, you know, you learn that grieving is a lifelong process until you return yourself to, to the creator. And so that's the kind of thing that I wanted to, to implant in the song. We have a beautiful saying uh, in, in Muslim culture, Arab culture, inna lillahu inna lihi raji'un, to Allah we belong and to Allah we all return. And it's meant to give people a sense of comfort, you know, in those really vulnerable moments in life where you're, you have to face either your mortality or the mortality of a loved one. And, um, you know, I remember. I remember when, when, when Baba had passed away, Allah Rahma, like it was around the same time that my nephew was born. So we had like baby crying simultaneously with like mother wailing, you know, and it's just this powerful sort of reminder of the cycle of life, like in that moment. Um, and that's, to this day, it seems like anytime I'm hit with the news of, of a family member passing, it's also around the same time that someone you know, had just delivered a baby, and it's that, it's that cycle, you know. Uh, so I tried to make sure that the song embodied that idea. And interestingly, in the video, um, it happened that we were creating this video when I was doing um, some work with the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And they had acquired a uh, 17th century living room from Damascus. And so it was an opportunity for me to activate this space um, was something more than just, you know, what they were planning to do, which was just put it up in a museum behind a velvet rope and not let anybody kind of see it from the inside or experience it from the inside, uh, the way that it was intended to be when it was first made. Uh, and that experience and being able to include it in the music video was really powerful because it was also something that brought together my love for architecture and my love for my own heritage. Uh, and my music and poetry all in one, one place. Um, and I continued through that experience to work with other 
I, to this day, to work with other museums that have these rooms because they're very fashionable now. You know, everybody wants a Syrian room. And uh, I was telling you guys earlier, like, it's beautiful to see your culture represented, you know, at a museum, but it's also ironic and sad when you realize a lot of these places don't want the Syrian people, but they want the room, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's important to recognize those things, I think. But uh, in addition to that, the video also featured um, photos of my father that I hadn't seen up until basically that year that we made the video. Uh, I received a stack of photographs from my sister that were from his time in college. Uh, he had, like I mentioned, he was from Hama, but he uh, had the highest marks in Hama, and so he was able to go study, he had a scholarship to study in Egypt at Ain Shams University. And I found these old black and white photographs of him studying at Ain Shams and with friends of his from college. Um, interesting note, when I put out the video, uh, Someone wrote me on Instagram and said, hey, that's my, that's my dad, you know, and it was basically a friend of my father's in one of the photos. His son saw the video and he, and he was able to make the connection. It was really beautiful. Um, and then one more thing I'll say about it is we filmed uh, scenes at a date palm farm uh, in the Coachella Valley. And that's like two hours east of Los Angeles. I lived in LA for like 17 years. so. Um, it was basically uh, a way for me to also kind of display the connection to Arabness in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this is the largest date growing region in the Western Hemisphere. Dates are so central to, to you know, Arabness and Arab culture. And, um, and I, I was able to find, uh, it was a second generation Egyptian American family that was growing dates. They had a date palm farm there. Uh, and I met this man who, basically took over the operation from his father. Uh, his name was Mark. Uh, he was born the same year as me. Uh, he lived a completely different life. He had like a cutoff shirt and like a pickup truck. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, but he understood what I was trying to do with this video. And he, and, he, and he felt really kind of drawn to the idea. And he welcomed me on his farm. And we had these really fascinating conversations about life was like, about what life was like for him growing up in the desert in America on a date palm farm. Uh, and yeah, so a lot of really beautiful serendipitous things happened in that in the making of that song and that video. And it also featured a young woman by the name of Saruna uh, from from Palestine, from Ramallah, uh, playing the Qanun in the song. And I met her a few years prior at the Berklee College of Music in Boston. Uh, and she was just really lovely and had, uh, we made a connection and I asked her to feature on the song and she did and it was, it was nice. We, it's funny, the weekend we filmed the video out there, I think it was actually Coachella Festival weekend. And I was the only musician going like 15 minutes past the festival <laughs> <laughs> to go to a date palm farm and film music video scenes. Uh, so and then I remember like we, we went to like a gas station uh, and there were all these kids wearing all this weird cultural appropriated stuff like at, at the, <laughs> the gas station. And uh, yeah, I was just looking at like, you know, the irony of life, you know, in that moment. Yeah. It's kind of interesting, you know. So you were, you know, obviously inspired by your father and his journey. And you're also inspired to do a lot of philanthropic work. So you've raised millions for different humanitarian relief mm. groups. Can you tell us a little bit about that effort and the organizations you support? Yeah, and I, you know, I have to put a footnote there, like me helping to raise millions is just a reflection of how generous our community is and how beautifully uh, uh, giving we are and our people are. And so, you know, Islamic Relief, Syrian American Medical Society, like uh, Karam Foundation, there's so many organizations that rallied uh, together to support the Syrian people and the Syrian cause, uh, you know, for the past 10, 11 years. And it's just been an honor for me uh, to be able to kind of use my work as a platform or as a, a conduit for, for that kind of generosity from people. And as, that, as generosity, it's also just understanding the sense of responsibility that we have here. You know, many of us come from uh, war-torn places. You know, we understand how it's like you, we got the golden ticket just by being able to get here. Many of us have family members back home who didn't get the opportunity, who we try to help 
in different ways, you know. And so I feel like it's, uh, it's yeah, again, it's like a responsibility. For me, it, it started even before the Syrian conflict, though, you know, um, Palestine and Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, New Orleans. And there are all kinds of just fundraising initiatives and uh, organizations that I tried to just to lend a hand to, to support, to, to make connections between the struggles of our people and people here. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's it's important, I think, to to recognize that like you have an opportunity every time you get on a stage to say something. It doesn't mean it always has to be political or always has to be, you know, necessarily very like deep and, and heartfelt. But like, uh, but there's still a, a, you're representing something, you know, uh, whether you realize it or not. And and for me, I always had to be aware of that just because I knew. Uh, so many times I would be the only, I would be the first Arab somebody interacted with or saw, you know, in, in front of a microphone saying something. Um, and so whether that meant that I had to represent for my people or just the fact that I had to represent in such a way that they left with a good impression, you know, was something I always thought about. I just have one more question before the first uh, performance session. So your music is a mix of, of English, rap, hip-hop, mm. and Arabic music, and some, some oriental instruments like the Qanun and Oud. Do you see yourself as an Arab and trying to implement uh, some of the, uh, the American culture within your, your music? Or you look at yourself as an American and you want to incorporate your heritage or somewhere in between? Uh, I think that's uh, you know it's a very interesting question. I might have answered it differently at different phases in my life. Uh, ultimately, you know, it's like I feel like we're all bridges in some way between um, cultures, between generations. Uh, I, I hope my music can be seen as that. Um, it's you know a journey of exploration and it's uh, an attempt to honor. The heritage, you know, of my of my my family, my parents, uh, and then also the culture that I owe so much to, which again, you know, African American culture, hip hop is firmly rooted in, and American culture in general, you know, the the, the things I love about it oftentimes came from the black community, and so it's like I I want to make that clear as well. Plus, now my wife is black, and my children have this, you know. Uh, multi-dimensional understanding of, of who they are, hopefully will. Um, so for me, it's important, you know, to again, be a bridge. And I don't, you know, for a, a bridge doesn't favor either side, you know, for it to balance properly, it has to kind of be right there uh, where it is. And I hope that's something people see in what I do. Uh, but, but the truth is like, I also, I'd say more like 70% of my lyrics are in English. Mm -hmm. Thematically, it's maybe more than that, but like 70% of my stuff is in English, and so for what it's worth, you know, like I, I recognize that, and I hope that it's like seeing that I'm not trying to create something n different and unique necessarily. Like I don't call this Arab rap or Syrian rap. Like that never really felt right to me. You know, I'm a hip hop artist. I participate in hip hop culture, and I hope what I bring to it is unique and you know, uh, appreciated for that. Um, but I, I will say it's been an honor recently, to, and this is a good segue, uh, to perform with uh, musicians who play traditional uh, Arabic instruments, such as this beautiful instrument right here, the oud, that uh, my dear friend Rani Ma'ali is going to come up uh, and share the stage with me to perform. Uh, it, it's like, it's a great bridge, you know, because I, I love Arabic poetry, I love spoken word, I love rap music. And when I'm with Ronnie, I can kind of seamlessly transition between them. Uh, and I think that's a testament also to the way that he grew up, you know. I found like a, a mirror to what I'm doing and what he does uh, on stage. And, uh, and that's why, you know, well, we'll talk about it later, but the Little Syria show kind of grew out of that, you know, experience. And, right. Yeah, we'd love to listen to some of this performance. All right. All right. So we get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, Rani Ma'ali.
Do they still say that I'm underground? I do not care, it is there we are all going. All praise is due to the most high and the all-knowing. I'm just an uber curious dude delivering food for a thought so mind-blowing makes you want to hit rewind knowing it tastes better the next day. Like Syrian mom's food. Now press play. What a fine showing a rhyme schemes my mind streams in the best ways of Damascus. Spectacularly sacrificial chess plays on that Eid al-Adha. Hi, my, what blessed days seen since I was a teen. Fond of the finest greens, the wally twisting consistently, refining the kinds of dreams that stretch way, way back to when kale was but a garnish. Say Jack was spinning wheels and MJ's rep still wasn't tarnished. That's the 90s, y'all. Hip hop's finest hour. At least that's what the old heads, insecure about the power of our youth leading the way, say. Why? The artist's life is but a relay race, so push your culture forward or forfeit and get out the way, okay? Bye. Nah. I prefer to race alone. Nadir Khalili on my dome, the architect of my own destiny till Allah brings me home. Oh, I pray you read it. The astrolabe to life that's in your chest, a hundred thousand times a day it's beaten. Best believe you're blessed. The first organ to start, the last organ to stop. 37 trillion cells in your body all play their part. Your heart's miraculous. You have to understand that fact. Don't take a single breath for granted. The pandemic taught me that. I'm breathing deeper now, raising little people now. As far as I'm concerned, I made it. I don't need a million people around, watching my every move, not in a stadium nor on my phone. Nothing else to prove. I have some land that I can call my own and creep around, but naked if I want to. Though I don't believe in ownership, that outlook is just wrong. Dude, it's haram too. See, we are nothing but some stewards here. 28 years later, I still miss you, Baba, and wish you were here. I'm 40. You were 52 when I was but a shorty. Seeing you drifting through the portal, every mortal is afforded when we're through with here. Dunya, level one, done. Rest in peace, Abdul Latif. You had two, I had one son. Responsibilities are one ton. Shoulders getting stronger. Vision scope been getting longer with each picture that I drew in here. Now come, come. Just trying to think a couple steps ahead of all the algorithms in my head. What fun, fun patterns I created that I no longer may need. I shed, or at least I should. As long as I have Allah's love in mind, then I believe I'm good and done, done. One. وهذه الكأس والراح إني أحب وبعض الحب ذباح This is Damascus And this is a glass of spirit comfort I love But I'm aware of the fact that certain kinds of love can slaughter you in their wrath I'm a Damascene being dissect me into haves and have not But grapes and apples fall in your path Open my veins with scalpels, hear ancestral chants of heart Transplants can cure some of the passion And why does mine stay torn in half? Then minarets crying tears of absence Like trees that so speak, years have passed them You can hear them asking for civil rights to live amongst tears of Jasmine as house cats take naps relaxing. This is Damascus. Mm. Yeah. So if I ask you what's Damascus like, you tell me that it's like a glimpse into the afterlife, alright? So that if they ask you what's Damascus like, say it's a glimpse into the afterlife. 
That's what I tell them when they ask me, what's the mask is like? I tell them that it's like a glimpse into the a hellish heaven, heavenly hell, when relishing in poetic embellishments, memory fails, coffee grinders crackling, childhood reminders back, when how could I forget one mild reaction, to cardamom's strong fragrance, yet and still finds attraction, as proud fathers wait for a sweet daughter's face, I'm asking, my roots, heart, and language are here, how am I supposed to make myself any more clear, is clarification necessary with love so dear, so much so, there was no fear, how many Damascene bracelets were sold for this poetry here, Apologizing to the willow, wondering if my little siblings can hear My parts been scattered cross coast for years Lanterns on horizons floating, saddened eyes and lost their hopes to see it Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Well, Omar, that was, uh, that was really amazing. So the th couple things we want to touch on before we get back into the more fun part of the event. Um, so you worked on a theatrical performance called Little Syria. Yeah. Um, you guys did it in New York and overseas, which we'll talk about it a bit later. Tell us a little bit about Little Syria, it's the idea behind it and the performance. For sure. Uh, so Little Syria is basically a uh, unique theatrical and musical experience where I bridge the traditions of the Hakawati, the Griot of Damascus and Jerusalem and Beirut and all you know, the cities in Bidad al-Sham that have this tradition. A storyteller, uh, kind of similar to this, sitting on an elevated platform in a cafe, telling stories, poetic stories and parables. Uh, you know, the lessons uh, that the Hakawati imparts on the community are sort of baked into the story in a really beautiful way oftentimes addressing directly the issues that the community is even facing and dealing with. Uh, and I've always been fascinated by and loved this tradition of ours. And uh, so it's bringing that sort of Hakawati tradition to, uh, to America in hip hop theater form. And uh, I had the idea to kind of do this when I was a Kennedy Center fellow, a citizen artist fellow. I'd always loved uh, the work of the Mahjar poets, the migrant poets, uh, people from Rabit al qalamiyah which you mentioned earlier, the Penn League writers like uh, Jibran Khalil Jibran, Amir Rehani, Ilya Abimadi, Abdel Masih Haddad, Mikhail Naima, uh, Nasib Arida, so many who, amazing uh, writers from the community that lived in New York on the Lower West Side of Manhattan wrote in Arabic. Uh, this community was really uh, influential because they had actually modified the printing press to be able to print in Arabic faster and publish newspapers faster there on Washington Street between Rector and Albany where the community had coalesced. And uh, only a couple thousand people but several dozen uh, newspapers, you know, the highly literate community, very much valued uh, being able to tell their stories, kind of like we do today on Facebook. Non-stop. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no, but all jokes aside, like I'd always thought that this would be a really cool uh, story. The stories, these would be cool stories to explore. And it, the crazy thing is, like Americans don't know about this history, don't realize how influential it was on us, and uh, and ultimately on them. You know, I mean, Jibran, Khalil Jibran's the third highest-selling poet in human history, which is like pretty remarkable feat. And this is. Uh, little Syria, but it's obviously uh, at a time when the nationalistic borders that we know today weren't uh, drawn up by the French and the English and carving up Bilad al-Sham and the cohesion that Bilad al-Sham, you know, uh, had for, for thousands of years, you could say, you know. And so having someone like Rani, who, as I said earlier, is from a Palestinian family on stage with me, having someone like Joey, thanks Joey, who's the beat maker, a lot of the beats that you hear today, all of them, in fact, are uh, made by him. Uh, from an Orthodox Christian Syrian family, uh, originally married to a Palestinian from Chicago. Um, you know, I think like it, it's in our, in our own way, we're kind of reviving that, that, that idea. And I see that with the younger generation of Arabs here, you know, in America. It's like, we don't have the luxury of dividing ourselves across these. It's not a luxury, in fact, I should, I should rephrase that. But. Uh, we, we see past, often can see past these nationalistic sort of borders and, and recognize that we have this shared uh, heritage and culture. And so to celebrate that really is what I tried to do in this piece. Uh, there's a lot of really amazing stories I dug up from these, na from these newspapers, um, digging through the archives, did a lot of research to kind of tell these stories. 
Uh, NC State, uh, North Carolina State, has a Center for Lebanese Diaspora Studies where they've archived many of these newspapers. Being able to study and read uh, these newspapers in Arabic has been extremely helpful. Um, yeah, and, uh, and we ended up uh, you know, taking a brief hiatus uh, after creating the show first in 2019. Uh, as most of you could probably guess, because of the pandemic, we just kind of had to shelve the project for a little while, and I didn't know if we would ever see the light of day again. Uh, but in 2022, uh, I had the opportunity to perform at the Brooklyn Academy of Music at BAM, which is where actually these photos were taken. And uh, I was invited to perform there solo, but I said, no, I'd like to really kind of take this as an opportunity to just bring the show back to life. Uh, so I invited Ronnie out, I invited Joey, I even brought out um, uh, another local uh, Syrian singer, Nano, uh, really amazing singer, originally from Homs. Uh, some of you might know her. Uh, and so she was featured with us in the BAM show that we did, BAM is Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, last May. And we sold out three nights in a row, which was really amazing. Uh, Another really interesting fact is that, you know, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, a very historic venue, uh, had Syrian and Lebanese community events dating back to as far as like 1912. Wow. So, you know, what we were doing was carrying on a tradition that had already existed there uh, for over 100 years. Um, from there, I subsequently was awarded a grant uh, from Race Forward and Butterfly Labs Immigrant Narrative Strategy and Popular Culture, a grant to uh, produced the play on my own. Uh, and I did that at the Here Arts Center in Manhattan. That's actually where this photo was taken. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my good friend, Radwan Edhami. He's a Syrian uh, photographer, filmmaker. He uh, directed this, this run of it for us. Uh, we sold out again uh, and did two really you know, awesome performances there and filmed it as well. So we're looking forward to releasing some of that footage in, you know, this year. Uh, and now we have the opportunity to bring it to you all in Chicago. In May. Uh, thanks to Ronnie and another gentleman here in the audience, Asad Jaffrey, uh, who are working with the Old Town School of Folk Music. So we'll be bringing it to uh, the Old Town School May 12th and 13th. Uh, it's going to be an evening show May 12th, that's a Friday, and then a matinee and evening show that Saturday the 13th. So you'll have three chances, hopefully, not to miss it. Uh, and um, yeah, one thing I'm going to try to do, we're going to try our best to do, is to localize the story. So while Little Syria that we did in New York was about the New York community, and the bulk of the content is kind of about that experience, we will be also telling some of the stories from the Chicago community, because there's a unique Arab American story here that was written, and I think it deserves to be celebrated. In fact, Ronnie's own family is a testament to that. You've had family members here since... 1893. 1893. Oh. There you go. So, the World's Fair. In the Chicago World's Fair, exactly. And uh, yeah, so, you know, I think as the show travels, I'd like to kind of keep pushing that envelope and try to explore what the Syrian migration stories are like, where it goes. We're going to perform it in Los Angeles in November as well. Uh, a whole other kind of story happening there where many Syrian and Lebanese people had actually immigrated there, not from Ellis Island, but actually up from Mexico. Uh, with Latinized names and a whole different sort of like trajectory as far as how they became American, quote unquote. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, like uh, Syrians are everywhere. So who knows how far this show, this show <laughs> could go. Yeah. We, um, if there's money to be made, we'll find a way to go. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm going to talk about Rabat al-Qalamiya that was in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. um, today, the, the, the Arab immigrant community is much larger than it was then. Do you see similar cultural settings emerging amongst the community, or do you seek to recreate such cultural experience through your act or encourage it through your act? Yes and yes. I mean, look at this room. Like, this is it right here. This is what they dreamed of, and this is us continuing that tradition, you know. Uh, so thank you to you both, you know, through Chicago and Arabic, through Monteda, uh, and through the visionary sort of, like, uh, you know, ideas of people like uh, Fawaz, Allah, and, uh, you know, the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn has been doing a wonderful job of kind of, uh, uh, you know, carrying the torch in that way. Uh, we also have, uh, just recently actually in Southern California, I was at the celebration of a, uh, the designation of the Little Arabia District in Anaheim. You know, so many community members live there and they're able to get the local city council to finally designate that part of, 
Southern California as Little Arabia. Uh, and then, you know, what's also interesting is like while the initial immigrants who came were mostly from Bilad al-Sham, that's not the case anymore. We have people from Yemen, people from Sudan, people from Iraq, people from uh, the entire Maghrib region. We have, you know, people from all over. <laughs> Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco. Uh, and, and so the idea of being Arab American is much more expansive now. And I think that's really important for us to recognize. Uh, the fact that these initial community members, many of them, not all of them, had lobbied so hard to be considered white in America was like a, you know, an unfortunate uh, thing that we're now having to kind of reconsider in earnest um, because it doesn't serve us, nor is it true, nor is it like reflective of the reality of what so many of us live here. Uh, and so you know, that's another big thing that I think our community has to consider moving forward. Uh, and also just the idea of Arab is really interesting to me because like if it's one of those things that's like you try so hard to like define it and grasp it, it slips through like sand because it's like all of us have more than just like, you know, quote unquote, whatever that is, an Arab gene in us. You know, I know myself, uh, North African and Kurdish and Turkish heritage in my family. And so as proud as I am of this language and this culture and this tradition, uh, I also have to recognize that even in my own Arabness and my Syrianness, there's so much more there to celebrate and to recognize and to, you know, uh, honor. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'll say about that. But May 12th and 13th, uh, and the week before that is also the Chicago Palestine Film Festival. So, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that you attend those events as well. We're definitely going to share more information about uh, these events uh, in the upcoming days. My next question is going to be different. Um, my question is... <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so my question is uh, this segment called Explain That Gram. Okay. Um, we basically picked up a picture from your Instagram. Okay. And we need more context. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So first things first. Uh, this photo was taken on December 18th. That's what this says here. December 18th was uh, the day of the final match of the World Cup. Uh, Ronnie and myself, and thanks Joey, our, uh, you know, our third member of the Little Syria trio, the Fen League is what we call ourselves now. Um, we had been invited to perform in Qatar at the World Cup. We were there for actually three weeks. It was like a residency essentially at the Education City Stadium. and. Um, we had the honor of performing for people from all over the world as they would both enter the match and as they would leave the match. We would be there waiting for them. Uh, and it was really interesting because it was like uh, the first time that I'd experienced a situation where a performance setting where the outcome of the match determined the, the, the <laughs> temperament of the audience. <laughs> And um, usually that was a good thing, but man, there were some upsets. Like it was a weird, uh, weird energy. Like when Brazil lost, my God, uh, there was like maybe 12 Croatians there, 15. And then there was like an ocean of dejected yellow jerseys. And for people who don't know, I mean, everybody knows this, but like if there isn't an Arab or North African team to root for, the default team for everybody in the Arab world is Brazil. And, uh, and so there was a lot of sad, sad fans that day. Um, but we did our best to lift their spirits, you know. Uh, there was also on the flip side some amazing, amazing uh, upsets by the Moroccan team. Uh, you know? and we had the honor of being there, you know, when they beat Spain, when they beat Portugal. We were right outside cheering with everybody and they were so incredibly uh, supportive of us on stage. Uh, knowing Ronnie was uh, Palestinian, I was Syrian. Ronnie has a whole repertoire of Moroccan music that he knows how to play on the oud, and we we started to celebrate with them and played Moroccan music for them. Ya bint bladi, ya bint bladi. Yeah, so you know it was just celebration, and then every single game without fail, there were Palestinian flags raised, there were Palestinian flags sewn inside the flag. Um, so it was just a beautiful, a beautiful experience overall. I think, you know, um, hats off to Qatar for 
pulling the plug on uh, on drinking at the matches just before because honestly it made it such a safe and clean and family friendly organized environment it was probably the one of the nicest world cups in that way the first time a british national was not arrested for drunken disorderly conduct at the world cup. <laughs> Uh, they have a Qatari to thank for that. Um, so anyway, some more context for that photo, if you want. Basically, the um, prior to this one, the one... Stuff of, for me to go back oh, here. Stuff for you to go back. <laughs> All right, don't worry about it. Anyway, I had a hoodie on that said December 18th, because uh, that's actually Qatar National Day. It was the day that the match was happening. It's also International Arabic Language Day. And it's my birthday. So, yeah, so that's why. Uh, and I was holding a little uh, mette cup, if you're familiar with the drink. Yeah. 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 Yerba mette, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. In the final, I mean, it was, uh, it was definitely a, a, a beautiful thing to see Messi, you know, complete football, as they say. Uh, and there's so many Syrians, you were saying Syrians are everywhere. There's so many Syrian and Lebanese people in Argentina also, and so much so that the culture was brought back to us in the form of mette. Uh, we drink it in Syria, and many people don't even realize it comes from Argentina. <laughs> uh, we drink it a little differently, uh, but still, yeah, it's, uh, it's the same. And so that's what I'm holding there in one hand. I have a little, um, uh, a little stuffed animal I brought for my, uh, for my daughter, an oryx, which is like the national symbol of Qatar. Uh, it was once endangered, uh, but it is not anymore. Uh, what else? And I got my, my tarbush on, you know, the, mm -hmm. the classic offendant tarbush, which I actually had made in Egypt at one of the last like traditional tarbush makers' is, uh, shops, using old Ottoman tarbush like presses. And uh, his name is literally Ahmed Muhammad Ahmed al Tarbishi. So, like, <laughs> I, and I found actually my friend Saif sent me a photo recently from the 1940s of they had the same sign up in the shop. And he was telling me, the shop owner, that his great-great-great-great-grandfather used to make the tarabish for like uh, Al-Malik Faru, and they also are the ones who make all of the, uh, you know, all of the hats, I guess you could say, for um, the graduation at Al-Azhar, and they do like little souvenirs for weddings in Kuwait, and like all kinds of things. And I asked him, I was like, where, where else do they make them? And he said, the only other place that he thinks makes tarabish as well as he does uh, Halab, and he uh, and he was telling me how he had a good friend up there who uh, who also made tarabish. But anyway, just that's that was that photo. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot into it. Uh, yeah. Uh, just wanna just wanna ask you about. Uh, so we talked about little Syria. Uh, I wanna ask you about your future plan. Sure. Well, I mean, actually, these two, these photos that you just had up here are really interesting. When I was in Qatar, as I said earlier, like I take the opportunity to, to, to activate these Damascus rooms wherever we go. And so um, they had one that they had just opened at the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar. And while we were there, I asked a friend if we could get permission to go and film there. And we shot, uh, a, inshallah, a performance that will come out soon. But... Um, a performance of the song Damascus that we, we, we did earlier in that space uh, while we were there. And um, I got emotional, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how, like, I mean, I, I wrote that song, my God, over a decade ago. Uh, and when I'm in a room like that and I'm, I'm reciting it and we're all there together, like, it just feels, uh, you feel the, the weight of it, you know, the wood paneling is from wood that was harvested in the Uta right outside of Damascus and it's like you know you, you feel 50% of your DNA is in that paneling and then the, the, the Ajami style painting that's uh, painted on there by the hands of somebody who you know uh, carries the same traditions as you like it's powerful and the poetry that's inscribed on the walls and uh, the, uh, the feeling you know it's just uh, especially not being able to go back to Syria. It's just extra uh, heavy. And I feel grateful that I could do it with, with Rani, I could do it with Joey. Uh, and um, we, at the end of that experience at the World Cup, it happened that there was a performing arts festival taking place called the Darisha Performing Arts Festival. And so th they liked our performances so much outside of the stadium that they asked us to stay and perform. And so we did like a little tiny 30 minute sort of version of Little Syria, which is what this is here. Um, 
And uh, our plans for the future, I talked about, you know, we're doing it here in May, we're doing it in LA in November, we have a whole bunch of other shows lined up. Uh, Ronnie's getting his PhD at the University of Chicago. And <laughs> We recorded, while we were in Qatar, a whole album um, as well, a new album, uh, sort of reintroducing us as the Fen League to people. So I'm, I guess I'm premiering that idea for everyone now. Pen League, Fen, Fen League. League. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll be on the road. We also have uh, some performances lined up in, uh, at UNC, at Emory, at Georgetown. You know, um, we'll also be doing a little serious show again in Chicago at uh, Joe's Pub, which is uh, part of the public theater. Yeah, so we're working. And we got kids, so you know, they kind of dictate what, what you're going to be doing on any given day <laughs> as well. Yeah, That's very exciting. So Amar, from your journey, what would be an advice that you'd offer for a young Arab American who is looking to embark on a journey in the arts? Oh, man. Uh, don't do it. Be a doctor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I would say it's uh, obviously everybody has their own path, um, but it's it's really important to have a community uh, around you who supports you. Artistic community. It's even better if they happen to be you know also Arab or you know um, where you're from. So I just feel fortunate that like, you know, I get to work with Ronnie, I get to work with Joey and other great artists. I, I, I also see now organizations that support people like us more than there were growing up. Um, shout outs to the Pillars Fund as well, who is in the audience, based here in Chicago and have been incre incredibly supportive of uh, storytelling and arts initiatives uh, in the Muslim community. Um, and. Yeah, the Syrian Community Network and all kinds of people who just do so much important uh, sort of uh, community building. Uh, just connect with them. And I think for me, one thing I'm proud of, and that I hope this is something that, uh, you know, might be a benefit to others, is like to uh, just always remember how fortunate you are to have an audience, no matter how small or how big it is. Uh, the fact that somebody's there to support you is, is a gift and to honor that and to not, you know, feel like you wish something was different, you know. Uh, I've always felt very, alhamdulillah, just very content with every stage of it. Um, and never tried to be like, oh man, I wish I was bigger or I wish I was this or was that. And that's just always made me feel very grateful for each and every person and every uh, ear and you know every um, audience member and I think that's important you know because life is, is precious and valuable and the fact that somebody will sit there and listen to you is such an honor you know um, because you're here one day you're gone the next you know and so like don't don't forget how special each moment is and can be I think that's what I'll say and we're so honored to, to have you here uh, thank you uh, one final uh, segment called Fire Round. Oh God, You're okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so just uh, uh, maybe uh, in few words, what mm -hmm. motivates you? My children um, and the world that I want to see them inherit from us. Okay. Can you share your best moment in your career so far? Wow, that's hard. Uh, but performing at the World Cup was pretty special. Uh, and uh, and uh, selling out the Brooklyn Academy of Music was pretty special. And, uh, you know, I'll also say we, last year we, we opened for Mo Amer at the Ford Amphitheater. It's my favorite venue in Los Angeles. And it's really beautiful. It's like 1,200 people. Uh, and there was like just the moonlit sky and palm trees and um, twelve hundred like you know Palestinians <laughs> <laughs> cheering and Mexicans. I didn't realize how many, how many Mexicans love Mohammed. It was actually amazing. Uh, yeah, it was it was a beautiful night. It was a beautiful night for sure. Yeah. Okay. Now on the flip side, what's the uh, you know, most challenging or... You're supposed to ask that first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most challenging? Uh, 
for a long time, it was really hard to convince, you know, everybody from my, my, my mom to like the community at large, the validity of what I do, you know, uh, and the importance of art, like in general, you know, coming from a community that often felt like, uh, like, okay, but what's your real job? You know? uh, <laughs> And I think, you know, alhamdulillah now, I think people have gotten used to me and hopefully f by extension the idea that other uh, Syrian and Arab people can, can embark on a career in the arts and it's, and it's just as important as anything else anyone might decide to do with their life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, one last thing, describe yourself in one word. Oh, man. <laughs> Afendim. <laughs> Offendum and authentic have the same root word, so you know, that's what it is. Um, uh, Omar, you're, you're a brilliant musician and Thank artist, you. and uh, we're you. so happy to, to have met you, and uh, we're, we're really enjoying your Thank you. This one's for Haifa, Yafa, Akka, Gaza, Ariha, Ramallah, Tabaria, Ramla, Janin, Safa, Bedlaham, El Quds, Minas Sahra, the Lishbad, and every Philistine you heard around the world where boys and girls are taught to hit bitch for they walk, learn to Zagreb for they talk, where Tatriz ain't just an arts part and parcel of a lifestyle that connects them to the roots of olive trees and orange groves where thuggers, settlers pointing. <laughs> Taxes committing war crimes of the worst type, emboldened by some fascist leadership. Too blind to see that these apartheid walls erected prevent us all from being free. So God bless the truth seekers, solidarity movements, journalists, and academics being blacklisted for views that pose a threat to the establishment and its chokehold on the news. Though off the pills we've lost already, there is still way too much to lose. <laughs> A nation state is not salvation no matter how much you defend it. Dialogues without some patience and disagreements never end in. Religious men who are not humble only play themselves pretending they alone have all these answers. Mixing messages they're sending. Was it Ishmael or Isaac? What is asking Mr. Point? Will it be Jesus or Elijah? Why would Allah disappoint? Look, if you know death is inevitable, then let nature take its course. No homicides nor suicides will open heaven's gate by force. But what is life without a struggle? But a hollow shell of dullness. Why be Jewish, Christian, Muslim if you don't believe in oneness? Adonai is not a realtor or a predatory lender. Not a judge who can be bribed nor a crooked criminal defender. He is kindness and compassion, justice, mercy, fairness, and togetherness, and of all praise, worthy. The creator and sustainer of the moon and stars above. La ilaha illallah. Hallelujah. God is love. God is love. God is love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is love. God is love. God is love. Where are we going, Ronnie? Hallelujah.